Autism in Entertainment is proud to have an Emmy and Annie Award winning animator, actor, writer, director as our keynote speaker. Put your hands together for the talented Jorge Gutierrez. Thank you. Thank you guys uh, for the imi invitation. Uh, I have like 400 panels, so I go fast. Uh, and, and there might be some cursing, so I apologize in advance. Yeah. But it, it, it's hard to you know, talk about Hollywood and not curse. So here we go. Uh, so my talk is called Fighting with Autism. Uh, I'll just start from the beginning. Why, why should you guys listen to me? Uh, what, what the hell have I done? Uh, so these are the two, the three things I've done that are kind of what I'm known for. Uh, seven years apart, which is crazy how long these things take. Uh, it all began, I'm 49 years old. Uh, I was born in Mexico City. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was just another kid from Mexico. Uh, and uh, autism superpowers, and I had no idea. Uh, my, my father was an architect, my mom very bohemian. Uh, I believe my dad was on the spectrum, but he, he was never tested. Uh, Pinocchio was the first movie I saw in, in a movie theater. Uh, and uh, and uh, that really affected me uh, when, they, when they killed little Pinocchio. Uh, so I became <laughs> obsessed. Uh, and so I started cosplaying as Pinocchio uh, for a long time. And I was obsessed with becoming a real boy. I think even back then I knew I wanted to be like everybody else, right? I wanted to be normal. Uh, and I, my family super loved me and just said, oh, he's a little weird and he, he just really likes to draw. Uh, and that's when I kind of realized, hey, I, maybe I'm not like the other kids. Uh, and my dad would always ask me, why do you love to draw? And I would always answer the same, uh, I don't know. And my dad would smile and go, I like that answer. Uh, so these are my, my you know, little, regular little kid drawings, six years old. Uh, this is what I drew, my first nude. <laughs> Uh, I was just obsessed with, uh, with drawing. Uh, I saw Michael Jackson's thriller and it really affected me. I, I became obsessed with it. Uh, and again, I dressed up as other people because I, I was trying to fit in. I was trying really hard uh, to be like everybody else. Uh, when I was nine years old, we moved to Tijuana, which is uh, the most dangerous city back then in the, in the world, a really, really tough place. Uh, it was a pretty crazy place uh, across from the US. So it's Mexico and the US. Uh, that's literally where I lived. Uh, I, could, I could throw a stone into the U.S. if I wanted to. Uh, these were my regular drawings, again, as I, I kept getting older and older. Uh, and Tijuana was pretty crazy. I was obsessed with The Simpsons. Uh, regular kid drawings, right, at 12 years old. Uh, and 13, I started making comics and writing. I went to a public arts high school in, in, in Mexico. This is me at 15, uh, being in an art show. Uh, I discovered kind of movies at, a, at the Cinetech in, in, in Tijuana. Uh, I met the love of my life in high school. I proposed two weeks from the day I met her. Uh, she said no. But eight years later, she said yes. So it, it took a while. Uh, when I was a kid, my, my dad said, uh, you know, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, oh, I want to be a painter, I want to be a writer, or I want to be a film director. Uh, and someone said, that's animation. You get to make paintings move, you get to tell stories, you get to make movies. So my dad, being you know, a Mexican dad, goes, find the hardest school in the world for that, and if you can get in, then maybe I'll let you go into that. So uh, I found out about this school called CalArts, founded by Walt Disney, you know, big animation school. Uh, I called the school, this is early 90s or late 80s, and uh, pre-internet, and they said, bring figure drawings uh, and bring animation drawings, and I had no idea what those two things meant, so I looked it up and I said, oh, figure drawings, you draw models, animation drawings, I guess drawings of animation things. So uh, in Tijuana, if you did figure drawing at that time, uh, the only uh, models were exotic dancers. So I would come home with all these exotic dancer drawings, and my father would go like, where are you going? Where and, and take me with you. Uh, <laughs> and then I would, I would paint all the stuff I loved about Mexico, but then I would draw what I thought 
cartoon people wanted to see, so I drew Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse and Bart Simpson, all this stuff. So I go uh, get my portfolio checked by, by Cal Arts, who's the head of the experimental animation program. He's Hungarian, uh, Jules Engel, legend of animation, uh, Disney, you know, UPA, Fantasia, just incredible talent. Uh, he looked at my portfolio, and he, you know, first he looked at my favorite drawings, and he was really, really tough on me. And he goes, what, what, what is wrong with these women? Uh, <laughs> And he put that aside, and then he looked at my cartoon drawings, and he said, this is crap. This is all crap. Uh, he goes, a copy machine could have done this. You have no voice. You say nothing. And he was Hungarian, thick accent. He talked like Yoda. He goes, an artist you are not. <laughs> so he closed my portfolio, and I was 17, right, a high school junior, because I was trying to apply a year early to get rejected so that eventually I would get in. My, my system was to hack, hack the system by, by getting rejected early. And I think even back then I knew rejection builds character, right? So the, the sooner I can get rejected, the sooner I can get stronger. Uh, so he, he breaks this down. Oh. <laughs> by the way, terrible advice in, in other things, right? Like, but good advice as an artist. Uh, so he says all this really mean stuff to me. Uh, and then as I leave, I left my painting portfolio, and he goes, hey, sad boy, come back. <laughs> and he goes, what, what is this? And I'm like, oh, it's a painting about this lady who had an affair with a coyote, and it's about the border in Mexico and the U.S. And he starts laughing, and he goes, next. And I keep, uh, keep showing him all these different paintings, uh, and he asks me questions like, what does each one mean? What, what does it all mean? And he goes, you son of a bitch. <laughs> He goes, why you not show me this? And I said, well, because I, I didn't think this was animation. And he goes, ah, you're a stupid boy. <laughs> 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 he goes, this is your voice. And he asked me exactly what my dad asked me. Why did you do these paintings? And I said, I, I don't know. And he smiled, just like my dad, and he goes, you're an artist. That's why. So that was it, I got in, uh, and he told me right there on the spot, he said, uh, I, I like how you see the world, and you see it differently. So that, that made a big impression on me, I got in there. Uh, you know, my heroes back then, Steve Hillenberg, Henry Selig, Peter Chung, uh, those are the people uh, I admired. I go to this crazy school, met like-minded people, tons of neurodiversity. Uh, I work, basically I realized, wow, I can, I can focus harder than anybody else in my class, and artists are incredible procrastinators, right? They have a million excuses to not do the work. And you know, they need the blah, blah, blah software, they need to read the blah, blah, blah book, like all these excuses. So I was a terrible student, because I would go to the parties and show up with like 12 cases of beer, leave them there, and like go work. And then the next day I was like, wow, what a crazy party we had, man. <laughs> And then I would buy bootleg video games and like a drug dealer would hand them out so that people would play video games and I could use their lap time. So I was that kid. <laughs> so uh, I, again, didn't know I was on the spectrum. I could just focus and work harder than most people. So people would, at uh, CalArts, you would have to do a film a year. So I did, I think, four my first year. Uh, I ended up doing altogether 22 shorts. I did my bachelor's and my master's in six years. I got full scholarship from the school and the Mexican government, and I was just a machine, and I loved it. I couldn't believe that I was finally in a place where they let me do stuff I love. So I did cell animation, I did stop motion. Uh, you know, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, became sort of my muse. Uh, so I did all these live action little shorts with my family. Those are my parents and my sister, uh, my girlfriend. I got in trouble all over Tijuana. Uh, and then I became an intern. And that really, really kind of opened my eyes. I was a CG animation intern at Sony, uh, and I definitely found out I am not meant to be a CG animator. Because uh, I think internships are really helpful to also find out what you don't want to do. Uh, so I graduated in 2001 uh, from CalArts. I finished my student short. Uh, it was an eight minute uh, little short called Carmelo. It's on YouTube if anybody wants to see it. Uh, it won the student Emmy, and I got to go to the Cannes Film Festival. And at that point, oh, you guys don't have to clap. Like, we have a long journey ahead of us. <laughs> so uh, at that point, I was like, oh my god, being different is the thing that's making me stronger and better. So I just kept going. 
uh, an agent immediately signed me and said, hey, can you, can you turn this into a movie? So I went to a bookstore and I bought How to Write a Screenplay in 21 Days. And I was like, screw you, book. I'm going to do it in less. Uh, the book won. It took me longer than 21 days. It was really hard. Uh, so he sends me all over town. This is 2001 uh, to pitch the book of life. And every film studio told him the same thing. No one wants to see a film about dead Mexicans. <laughs> so I went to DreamWorks, Disney, Universal, Warner's. I went everywhere. Uh, and then, I was, as, as time was running out, I started seeing all these super crappy internet cartoons. And I said, oh my god, I can do a crappy internet cartoon too. <laughs> so I got a pirate version of Flash as an old software, and I taught myself Flash. So after spending three years on a student short, I spent maybe three weeks making this little short. I went online, I got 20,000 views in one night, which back, like for today, it would be like two million views. It was crazy. Uh, and the place where I did my internship called me up and said, we love your little short. How much did it cost? And in my head, I was like, well, it costs nothing. So uh, uh, $16,000. And they said, uh, I don't know where that number came from. And they said, uh, you know, we want to buy 30 of these. Uh, who wrote them? Who designed them? Who animated them? Uh, you know, basically me and, 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 and my girlfriend. So they were like, yeah, we'll hire both of you to just do what you already did many more times. So I went to work over there, uh, super crude, super limited. Uh, again, it's on YouTube. I, I got married on, on Day of the Dead. This is my, my wife. Uh, I wore a wrestling mask, like all proper Mexicans should. Uh, and at that point, I was like, oh my god, I get to make a TV show, a, a internet cartoon. We made it. And then two months after the wedding, boom, they canceled the show. <laughs> and I remember being in, in the studio when they shut down that division, and I was the only person with a giant smile. And at the end, when the HR people interview you, they were like, why are you so happy? Like, we're, we're letting you off. And I was like, but you guys spent literally thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to make me better. And I can't wait to see what I do with all this new knowledge you gave me. Thank you. And they were like, are you going to kill us? <laughs> <laughs> so bring it, Hollywood. Uh, so I went to work uh, on a show called Mucha Lucha. Again, technology became the, the sort of thing that allowed me to, to go into the industry. Uh, my internet cartoon was done in Flash. Mucha Lucha was the first show done in Flash at Warner Brothers. Uh, and I was the guy who, if you hired to do freelance, and you hired me to do one character, I would give you 20 characters in color. So any, anytime people would hire me, they were like, can you guest, der, you know, guest do a, a villain from an episode? I ended up being the guest art director for the whole uh, cartoon. So I just, again, the, the, this ability that I have to just work and have fun has been, has been the thing that has propelled me. Uh, so at that point, Walt Disney TV Animation called me in. We pitched a show called Pippa the Bull. It doesn't go through. But they loved us, so I worked on a show called The Buzz on Maggie with, with my wife Sandra. I tried to put as many Mexican things as I could in there, as you can tell by that sombrero. Uh, I like to believe that that's what got the show canceled. Uh, <laughs> so ride or die, we keep going. Uh, we had three more shows in development, right? Because at this point I felt, well, we had one show, let's just keep pitching. And every time I pitched a show and it got rejected, I would be the guy who would ask, well, can you tell me what I could do to make this better? Like, I never took it personal. That's another gift I have that, you know, it's a cliche when people say, it's a business, don't take it personal. I can literally not take it personal. And so that's allowed me to survive, you know, emotionally in all these things. Because in our industry, you know, Guillermo del Toro always talks about how you have to have the endurance of a boxer, but the heart of a poet, right? So that's a really complicated thing to, to balance in both hands. Um, so after those three pilots getting killed, <laughs> guess what the fourth pilot was? El Tigre. So we, we make, let me check the time. Oh, we're doing it. Uh, El Tigre, we, we do a pilot in 2004. We do a series, uh, you know, a creator picture. I usually design all the men. Uh, my wife, Sandra, designs usually all the, all the female characters. We collaborate on all the villains. Uh, if you really break down El Tigre, and you really break down anything I've ever done, they're always about someone who doesn't fit in, right? So, you know, you always inspire a lot of your stories from where you were from and from your, your literally experiences. Uh, as I look back on all that stuff, I'm like, I think all my stuff is about 
being on the spectrum and all my characters are on the spectrum because I don't know how to not be on the spectrum. I have no point of reference, right? When people ask me like, well, what is it like to be on the spectrum? I don't know what it's like to not be on the spectrum, right? So El Tigre happens, again, worked my ass off. Other creators hated me because I was working so hard. Uh, inspired by our childhoods and inspired by Spaghetti Westerns. I'm a huge film fan, so I, I watch a million movies. Uh, again, didn't know that most people, if they like a movie, they only watch it once. I, I would watch it, you know, 30 times. Uh, so the show, very, really, really, really personal, inspired by my dad and my grandpa and obviously a lot of the, the, the stuff that happened to me. Uh, and my wife, so we, we, we did an insane amount of work on this show. Uh, it was pretty, pretty epic. All this uh, for one season. Uh, as you guys can see, it came out, it was a huge hit back then. Uh, 3.4 million views is a huge number for that era. Uh, it was a worldwide thing, and then we started getting uh, pictures from people from all over the world dressing up like the characters, which also was a huge deal, you know, McDonald's did the toys and did the DVDs and uh, it won the Annie for best show and Sandra was the first Mexican woman to win an Emmy for her character designs in New York. <laughs> for that you should clap, yeah. And then, uh, and then she looked down on me for a year. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, had, I had to man up and then uh, win five, mem five more Emmys so I could finally look at her eye to eye. Uh, so this is the most Emmys a show has ever won for one season in the history of Nickelodeon. Uh, and we said, oh my God, we made it. And then they canceled the show. <laughs> and again, uh, when they told us the show was canceled, I was super happy. And they were like, do you understand we canceled your show? I'm like, yeah. Why are you happy? I'm like, because again, now you spent millions and millions of dollars to make our thing, and I can't wait to see what I do with all this new knowledge you've given me. And again, they asked, are you gonna kill us now? <laughs> so I go to DreamWorks for one year uh, to develop Book of Life, uh, true story. When I submitted uh, Book of Life, back then they would write the coverage, write what they thought of the, the document. I wrote a 45-page outline on what the movie would be, and they wrote, you know, in 2001, they wrote uh, in immature, uh, macabre, amateur, it will never get made. They, and, they, and they would give it back to you with, the <laughs> with that stuff. So uh, after El Tigre, I got a call from DreamWorks, and they're like, hey, uh, do you have a Day of the Dead thing you'd like to pitch us? Because we heard you have one. And I took the same document, I ripped off the cover page, I put a new cover page, and almost as a joke, sent it in, and the coverage came back and it was like, unique, unlike anything we've ever read before. <laughs> Magnificent. So I go work there for a year and then after a year, uh, I'm told, what if it's a hip hop salsa musical with Lin-Manuel Miranda? <laughs> and this is 2009, so this is before Hamilton, before In the Heights was on Broadway. Uh, I quit on the spot. I said, nope, that's not my movie. Uh, and then, you know, at that point in my career, I had learned that no is the most powerful word in, in Hollywood. Uh, and I even told them, like, you tell Lin-Manuel Lin Miranda, you tell her. Uh, <laughs> you tell her good luck with her career. Uh, so years later, I, I met Lin, and I told him this story, and he was like, yeah, you kind of saved our career. That would have been a disaster. <laughs> so they canceled uh, the movie. Uh, my wife was pregnant at that point, point. Uh, and I remember my dad uh, saying to me, all right, because, you know, tough dad. He goes, what are you going to do now? You, you're going to be a, a father. Uh, and I said, oh, dad, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be more conservative. I'm going to take less risks. I'm going to try to go for sh more sure things, more stability, because I have a baby on the way. And his reaction was, huh, Jorge, he goes, did I raise a coward? And I was like, what? You know, that's, that's the C word in Mexico, right? I was like, what? And he's like, any success you've ever had was because you took risks. If you stop taking risks now because you're going to have a baby, what kind of example are you to that kid? You're going you're gonna to set yourself up for failure. If anything goes wrong, you're going to blame your family. And you're going to blame your son unconsciously. So if anything... Now's the time for more risk-taking. There's more at stake now. 
and like my mustache grew like five inches at that point. Like, <laughs> like I, I powered up. So go back to Disney, uh, and they're like, "You're back. We killed your last show." I'm, like, I'm ready for more. Uh, so we do another pilot. Uh, Tested really well, and then, you know, this is a different time. They were like, can your main character, who's a rebellious Latina, can she not be rebellious, and can she not be Latina? Uh, so we said, nope, and so they canceled it. Uh, so then, again, thank you for making us stronger. Uh, our son is born. I'll go back to Nickelodeon. They're like, we killed old Tigre, and you're back? And I said, I'm ready for more pain. <laughs> Give it to me. So we do a new pilot, uh, Hamlet with Mexican wrestlers in a video game world. It was going great. And then it was deemed too uh, unproducible because it was so ambitious. So they canceled it. Uh, again, thank you for making me stronger. Uh, then I go to Mad Magazine Cartoon, a Cartoon Network, and I got to make uh, little shorts. It was like going back to school. Uh, I got to, to make all these crazy little shorts and make fun of famous properties and things I love. And they were really cool. I, I mean, I got to do my take on Batman. <laughs> So, and then I started painting to relax, right? It was almost like I regressed to being a kid, uh, and I was like, well, now what? And then a studio from Dallas out of nowhere, who they've never made a movie, they're like, hey, we heard about your movie you quit at, at DreamWorks. We don't have that much money, but we can make a low-budget version of that movie. All you have to do is uh, move to Texas, and I've never been to Texas, and work in a studio that has never made a movie. <laughs> So all my friends here in LA were like, you are insane for doing this, and you have a baby. And I remember talking to my dad, and my dad was like, what kind of son did I raise? And I was like, we're off to Texas. So we go to Texas, they gave us a year to write the script, a year to develop all the characters. Uh, I got to hire a production designer, I got to hire an art director. Uh, we worked crazy hard again. Uh, we did maquettes of what the characters would look like, huge lineups. You know, the, there's three worlds, the land of the living, uh, the land of the remembered, which is basically the land of the dead, and then the, the land of the forgotten. Uh, so this is, this is sort of the pitch for the movie. Uh, we got to do nine paintings, and then they said, pick your, uh, the biggest producer you can find for this movie. So of course, Guillermo del Toro is my hero ever since I was a kid. He is definitely the guy I looked up to. Uh, I'm showing you guys these pictures because this is what his house looks like. So imagine going in there with your drawings and paintings and be like, hey, Mr. Guillermo, uh, look at my drawings. Like, very intimidating. Uh, he is, he's a huge collector of art and, and animation. And so I had the worst pitch of all time pitching him the movie. Uh, they had told us you have 30 minutes to pitch him the movie. By the time we got done with the tour of the house that he gave us, he said, I only have five minutes. Uh, and so my people betrayed me. <laughs> and we were outside pitching him the movie, and there were five leaf blower guys on the mansion next door. And as soon as I opened my mouth, uh, they were like, Bruh! And I, and I looked at Guillermo, and I was like, Guillermo, do we wait till they finish? And he, he stared at me with his beautiful blue eyes. And he goes, and he calls me Gordo, right, which is fat in Spanish. And he goes, Gordo, four minutes. <laughs> so I pitch him the movie in four minutes, and it's a, it's a disaster. It's the worst pitch of all time. Uh, it was terrible, terrible, terrible. Uh, and then at the end, we go back inside, and he tells me, Gordo, I know your pitch was terrible, but I have two daughters. And on Saturdays, we would watch El Tigre. So I know your cartoons, I know your sense of humor, I know, I know how much you love our country. Of course I'm gonna produce your movie. Aww. So we start making El Tigre, we, I mean, uh, The Book of Life, it was really hard. Halfway through production, we ran out of money. Uh, and also, Luca, our, our, my son, was diagnosed with autism. I, again, I did not know I was on the spectrum back then. Uh, and I, it fueled me. I was like, I have to be even more badass, and I have to work even harder, and I have to try even more. Uh, so we just kept working on the movie, and I kind of, I got, it, it almost worked to focus me more. Uh, so we worked really hard on the movie, uh, tried to make the movie look like paintings. That was, that was kind of the, the intent from the beginning. And then we ran out of money, uh, like it happens all the time, and we hadn't done The Land of the Remembered, which is the most complex. So they said, you have 
only enough money for 19 pieces of geometry for, for those of you who are CG modelers. That was it, that's all we had. So we came up with this Lego system, Paul Sullivan, the production designer, uh, and I developed this idea of like, well, let's just build from these pieces. Uh, so these are the 19 pieces we use, and obviously people don't believe us, so we had to do this video to show uh, how with 19 pieces we got to make the hardest shot in the, in the movie, uh, which is in the trailer, and I really believe this kind of sums up my career, where uh, you don't know what trickery is happening <laughs> to make you think a lot of things are in front of you. Uh, but we're all magicians, right, in, 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 in animation. And the audience wants to believe the magic. So those are the 19 pieces. So a movie comes out, I go on tour to promote the movie all over the world. This is the premiere, I don't even remember the premiere, I was so overwhelmed. Uh, all the actors showed up, I got Danny Trejo to kiss me, which was one of my dreams. <laughs> uh, Zoe Zaldana was, I believe, eight months pregnant and she actually showed up to the premiere, which was a huge deal. Movie comes out all over the world. You know, big, big release, art of book, album, bootlegs, uh, illegal versions of the movie, which I own a ton of, I love these. Uh, <laughs> It only won one Annie, but it was nominated for a bunch of them. And I, again, I felt like, oh, all the hardship, all the struggle just made me stronger. Uh, and, I, and my dad kept saying to me, look, Jorge, when you're born, you were born a puma. This is where El Tiwer came from, right? And he goes, every experience you had in your life is a stripe, and you become a tiger. By the time you die, I want you to be a panther, because I want you to experience everything. And every stripe, good or bad, mean the same, right? Because you learn nothing from success. You learn from failure. So fail, fail as much as you can and fail hard and you will end up a panther. Uh, and so I, again, take all these things to heart. Uh, I needed to rest because it was pretty crazy. So I started painting again. Uh, I painted a mural outside of a biker bar where all the bikers peed. I, I was like, because <laughs> all these little kids would walk by that, that wall and it was gross. So I'm like, let me paint there so that the bikers don't pee on it. And sure enough, they started doing photo shoots with girls in bikinis and stuff, so the bikers love that mural. Uh, and the kids got to walk without pee anywhere. So again, from that, El Pollo Loco said, hey, paint us a mural. Uh, crazy, so then I did a mural for El Pollo Loco. There was all this leftover paint, and I just started painting. And a lot of the paintings I did were things that Jules Engel told me not to do, right? Draw Popeye and all this pop culture from America. And I just started painting and painting and painting. And I would run out of paint and I would use different colors. Some of these paintings got me in trouble politically, uh, as you guys can imagine, especially that one. <laughs> So I would post all this stuff on Instagram, on Twitter. A gallery said, hey, we, we want to show your paintings. NPR did a whole thing about it. Uh, so I got to show all my paintings, and then they made a book out of my painting, so I'm officially a painter. Uh, and we started traveling all over the world to go to conventions, and people dressed up like the Book of Life characters everywhere. It's pretty nuts. Uh, we get these pictures all the time. It's kind of, kind of crazy to see these characters that came out of our head now be all over the world. People would get married as the characters. It's kind of crazy. Uh, Camilo Cabello dressed up as Los La Muerte. Uh, and then the tattoos, the tattoos started. We started getting all these uh, photos of people tattooing our characters on them. And, and as a lover of Nightmare Before Christmas, I, I couldn't believe that that was happening to us. Uh, there was an illegal musical in Mexico. <laughs> Uh, to me, the greatest honor is breaking the law for something you love. So I was super honored that they did this. I mean, this production looks insane to me. Uh, and then Microsoft hired us to do a Super Bowl commercial. And I can honestly tell you guys, I made more money from the commercial of the movie than making the movie. <laughs> so now I, I want to make movies so I can make commercials of the movies. <laughs> and we have to pretend we use these computers like we traveled back in time or something. <laughs> So we made the movie, you know, thank you, Book of Life. Uh, and then at 40 years old, I'm diagnosed on the spectrum. Um, when my kid was two and a half, my, my, we decided, hey, there's something happening with our son. We, we get him tested. Uh, sure enough, he's, he's high functioning autistic. And my parents' reaction at that time were, no, he's not autistic. And we're like, why not? And my dad said, because he's exactly like you. 
And that's when I was like, whoop, <laughs> like the world, like, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you didn't talk till you were five. And I remember being held back in school two years. Like, I remember how different I was. And so I said, well, I, sh I should get tested. Uh, so I, I finally got tested. I got diagnosed. Um, I was uh, diagnosed with 2E, uh, you know, twice, twice exceptional. Uh, there are things I'm really good at, and there are obviously things I'm really bad at. Uh, the, I've been masking my whole life, right? I, I, I just assumed that's what everybody did. <laughs> uh, I create characters of myself when I meet people, right? So, and a lot of people do that, and you know, normal, regular people are different versions of themselves when they meet their significant other, or when they're with their parents, or when they're in a job interview. Like, everybody becomes someone else to get the thing they need. We just do it differently, right? So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a really good student of humanity, so I'm constantly studying people. And it's very convenient for animation, because that's kind of what we do. We, we give life to inanimate things. Uh, I'm, I'm highly, uh, I'm a big empathy person, uh, which is a, a sometimes negative, because if you tell me something really, really bad, it really affects me. So I have to be really smart about how I control my emotions. I have a, whether you guys believe it or not, I have a crazy temper. Uh, and so I have to be really smart about not getting upset about things. Uh, and then the other one that I'm really bad at which I've, I kind of beat it out of myself, is I have a hard time looking at people in the eyes. So it's a game for me. When I talk to someone, I'm like, I start counting how long I can count. Most people have no idea any of this stuff, right? Uh, so those are the things that I'm bad at. The things that I'm really good at is I can just focus. I can hyper-focus, right? So I can sit down and look at something and work on it for eight hours, not go to the bathroom, not stand up, which is dangerous, too. Because uh, if I'm not careful, I can just work forever and literally work myself to death. So it's been a, a balanced learning how to use uh, these talents. And I, I, you know, people think it's a cliche, but to me it is a superpower. And I obviously can't speak for anybody else. I can only speak for me. But this superpower has weaknesses, right? Just like all great, all great superheroes, right? Uh, so it's been a thing that's propelled me. Uh, and this difference obviously has made me who I am. So Google hires me to do a virtual reality short. Let me check the time. Do, do, do. Two, three. All right. uh, and I said, oh, I'm going to do something about Mexican wrestling because putting on the virtual reality goggles feels like a Mexican wrestling mask. And I remember as a kid being taken to a bullfight, which I hated, uh, and this bullfighter got hit and his leg went flying. And I didn't know it was a prosthetic leg, by the way. Uh, and so I think I was the only kid in the whole thing screaming, oh, my God! And they're like, it's a prosthetic leg. And then the bullfighter, his name was a Gleason, he stood up with one leg, and he kept bullfighting with one leg. And my dad was like, Jorge, Jorge, look what he can do with one leg. What are you going to do in life with two legs? <laughs> it's like every opportunity my dad had to like beat me down with like inspiration. It was kind of amazing. It was his talent. So I studied all these athletes with one leg, uh, and I said, that's it. I'm going to do a, a virtual reality short about a Mexican wrestler who is missing a leg. And he has this family, right, a baby and a little kid, and he's over the hill. A very tragic short. For, again, it's on YouTube. But basically, he's going to die in a match so that his family can collect <laughs> the life insurance. Super tragic. <laughs> very Mexican. Uh, so we do this crazy short, uh, and it, you know, it was a ton of work. Again, I never worked for, for Google. Uh, I would go to San Francisco every week. Uh, it was kind of crazy. Uh, we do this, this crazy short. And uh, I'm going to spoil it for you. So this was really about autism, right? So for me, I felt like I was that wrestler, and I felt like, well, I'm autistic, and I have a son who's autistic, and, and maybe, maybe I'm done for. Maybe this is too much, too much to carry on, on myself. Uh, and then what happens in the short is he realizes he's missing a leg, right? He's not like other people. But he has a son who's special. And so in the short, the son puts on a special mask, and the son becomes his leg. And so together, they're even stronger. And that's basically what the short was about. It was like, even when you think you're missing a thing, there's other things that make you stronger. Right? So this thing comes out. Oh. No wins for this one. Uh, so then what? Uh, life goes on. Uh, because I did a lot of voices and all my stuff, all of a sudden, people who grew up watching the things I made were like, well, come do a voice for me. 
And I was like, well, I'm not a voice actor. And they were like, well, you do voices for you. Why can't you do voices for me? And I was like, how much does this pay? Uh, <laughs> so I became a voice actor. Uh, in 2018, we go to Netflix. Uh, Netflix series animation calls me up. Uh, I said, I'm ready to fight. Uh, I'm ready to join the battle. Uh, and it was a crazy pizza party. And they said, pitch us something you don't think you can get made anywhere but here. So I remember going to the Muse Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. Uh, and I said, everything I've made is about men. And a lot of it is about me. Uh, I think I need to make something to honor the women in my life. My wife, my mom, uh, my sister. These are all warrior women that I've witnessed fight their way through life. That's what I'm going to do. So uh, I pitched this crazy Lord of the Rings three uh, movie giant epic called Maya and the Three uh, event. We did it all at home during COVID. Uh, these are my sketches. I started playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, this is kind of the, the world of Maya, very much inspired by, by my wife when I met her. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of fantasy about Mesoamerica, right? There's a ton of fantasy about uh, myths from Europe and myths from uh, all over the world except Mesoamerica. So I said, I want to do that. Uh, and so we got to do uh, this crazy, crazy thing. I got to work with all the actors who had worked on Book of Life. I got Diego Luna to kiss me. Uh, as time went by, Netflix just saw what we were doing and kind of just left us alone. And you know, the thing I learned in entertainment is as long as you're under budget and on schedule and it's good, they just let you do your thing. And so that's always been my thing. I, I'm, I'm very, very conscious of time. I'm very conscious of the budget. So we make this crazy, crazy show. It's pretty insane. Uh, it took two years to make three movies. Uh, we did it with probably 25% of the budget of a giant movie. So again, super smart about how we use that. And I think, again, as an artist on the spectrum, I get to think about the whole thing and how much time and money things cost. So I, I'm, most directors don't care about that stuff. I, I care a lot about that stuff. We got Gustavo Santalaya, uh, who did Book of Life and you know, won an Oscar for Brokeback Mountain to do the music. A uh, show comes out. Again, we, you know, this girl had a birthday party that looked like this, so I have to assume her father is a drug dealer or something, because <laughs> it, it was in Miami, so it, it, the math, the math adds up. Uh, we get fan art from all over the world, uh, and you know, it was, it was kind of a big deal. In Japan, it really connected. Uh, we get letters, and we get pictures, people again dressing up like the characters, tattoos, there's murals in Mexico City, uh, 70 Annie Award nominations, uh, it won, Two Annies, including the big one, which is the best show, is top 10 in 55 countries in the world. Uh, it wins four out of five Emmys. I stabbed myself in the eye. Uh, <laughs> I was so excited. Uh, so thank you, Maya. And then I started doing art toys. I started doing murals for schools. Uh, film festivals invite me to do posters all the time. Uh, this little company called Apple asked me to do some designs for them. Uh, El Tigre keeps happening. Uh, you know, Got Milk hires me to do posters. Then the Obamas invite me to do a music video. Uh, basically, people from all over the world coming to, to the US to become citizens. It wins another Emmy. Uh, then, uh, <laughs> then I go on Twitter and I say, who do I have to kill to do an opening to The Simpsons? Uh, and then the Simpsons, the head, you know, the head guy in The Simpsons goes, you don't have to kill anybody. Let's just do one. So I'm doing the opening to The Simpsons this year. Uh, well, I'll go back. And obviously, it's a Halloween episode. Uh, that's why they look like these. Uh, so then, you know, Guillermo del Toro goes, hey, let's go to Annecy. This is last year. Uh, they invite me to do the poster for, for Annecy, which is a big animation festival for, for our industry. Uh, and uh, so what am I doing now on Netflix? Uh, I'm doing a new movie called That Chihuahua about a, a little underdog <laughs> from Mexico who has to fight his way through the industry. Uh, I'm working with Gabriel Fluffy Iglesias. Uh, this is our, our, I can't show you guys too much of this stuff, but it's basically an animal world, uh, and it's pretty crazy. And then I'm doing more stuff, because I can't help myself. So I'm doing my first ever adult animation limited series. It's in pilot. So I love Gandhi's Primal, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doing my, my thing. Uh, and then I'm doing a brand new limited series that takes place in the Maya Book of Life universe, which is in development. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I know people define being on the spectrum in very different ways. But for me, uh, I really believe we 
we do think differently. And I do think thinking different is a strength. And all the, honestly in history, all the big leaps happened when someone thought differently. It didn't happen because th someone thought the same, right? So, and if you look back historically, more than likely, a lot of the life and history makers are probably neurodivergent, right? We just didn't know. And so my talk is called Fighting with Autism, right? But I, I don't fight against autism. I fight with autism, right? It's, it's a, like, literally, it's a part of me. It makes me who I am. Uh, and as someone who was obsessed with Pinocchio, and Pinocchio, if you watch that movie, he's obsessed with becoming a real boy. And the journey is what made him a real boy. It wasn't the reward. So I like to say thank you, Autism, <laughs> for making me a real boy. <laughs> so. All right, you guys, we have... Well, thank you very much, Jorge. <laughs> One more round of applause, please. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It, it is such an inspiring Aww. story. Yeah. some questions. So that's a, an exciting time here. So thank you very much for uh, being with us here at Autism and Entertainment and for uh, allowing us to see your story and all the fantastic work that you have done. So we really appreciate it. Now, I would like to um, let you know there are going to be microphones run around. So if you would like to ask a question, and I believe there's one right there on the right hand side. Okay, so I know um, you had your diagram between, because like you were diagnosed with like 2E. Um, does that mean, like, uh, this is a two-parter, so if, depending on what you say, I might ask. Um, does that mean you also have ADHD along with the autism diagnosis? How do you manage the inherently contradictory thing of like the ADHD inattention and the hyper-focus? Like, how do you deal with that? Uh, so yes, I have ADHD, and what I, basically I hacked my brain. Okay. And so when I get bored, I work on another project. Really? And okay. So, bored, so you I just... work on another one. So I, I'm the work is consistent, right? A teacher okay. told me uh, consistency is more important than talent. Yeah. Okay. And so if you can hack that. So like if if you there's ever downtime, you can like write out something or yeah. draw something. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And by the way, the, the advice I always give is, if my dumb ass could do this, anybody can do this. Um, uh, Jorge, um, you know, that was a very interesting presentation. And you know, I was just wondering, since, since you did all that, all that writing and, and acting and all that stuff, I was wondering, uh, since, since you got so good at all that stuff, you know, uh, I was wondering if, if you still do some of that acting and screenwriting stuff today. Oh yeah, uh, basically what I figured out early in college was, I read this book by Robert Rodriguez uh, that said every uh, animation, well every film student has 10 really shitty shorts inside of them. <laughs> and the faster those come out, the faster you get to the good stuff, <laughs> right? And Chuck Jones had something similar, right? Chuck Jones, the Warner Brothers legend, he'd say it takes a thousand drawings to get to a good drawing. And what they're both saying is volume, right? Volume of work. The more you do something, it's not that it gets easier, it's that you get better. So the way I cheated in school was we would get a character design assignment and I would do 10. And I would curate and pick the best one and turn that one in. Not because I didn't want my classmates to hate me, so I was just getting better. I was like, I'm gonna cheat by getting better behind the scenes. And what I learned about writing and, and doing voices is, again, the only way to get good at it is to do a ton of it, and eventually, it becomes second nature. And I hate writing. 
It really is super hard for me. But I realized you have to <laughs> write. And so what, the way I tricked myself was I'm going to write in a way where I'm drawing with words. So that's how I approach writing. But volume, volume, volume. Again, consistency is more important than talent. And a lot of us on the spectrum, that's one of the things we're really good at, that we can just do it. Hi, Jorge. Hello. Um, firstly, I wanted to thank oh. you for all that you do. Um, oh, you're welcome. I, it seems like, like you place a lot of value in knowing yourself. I was wondering how long it took you to get to know yourself to the extent that you do right at this point in time. Whew. I think I'm still learning. And I'm oh. still, you know, one of the big things that happened to me was I would admire people, right, a lot of my heroes, and I would only admire their success. And the more I learned about them, the more I learned about their failures and their heartbreaks. And so when I would look at people's careers, I would assume it was like from this to this, right? In real life, people's careers are like this. Ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. And so what I, the, the way I tricked myself into honestly living with myself is this idea that I don't put value, this is gonna sound terrible, but I don't put value in the result, I put value in the process. So if I'm happy making the stuff, then no one can take the happiness out of it. Right? Yeah. I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it did. Um, kind of like how it's all about the journey, right? And not the destination. Yeah, I mean, it's all these cliches that are like Hallmark cards, they're all true. I actually do have a question. Yeah. Um, hey, Max. Uh, so, how do you control your temper? Because you said you've got a nasty one, and I also do. And usually, stuff like rejection, I can let roll off my back. But sometimes, you know, I get like ghosted by people I'm in talks with and stuff, and that just really sets me off for like a week. How do you handle your temper while working in Hollywood? Well, the the, the temper part, I. I Basically, kids would pick on me, and I would get in fights. Uh, I, and at some point, I realized, oh, fighting, fighting, no one wins a fight, right? I, even though I got really good at it, uh, <laughs> I, I would get in trouble. But eventually, I learned, I'll give you an example. So my first day at Sony as an intern, I, uh, and I would get triggered. Like, I showed up an hour early as an intern. Uh, interns were supposed to be, animation interns were, were supposed to be there at 6 a.m. I got there at 5 because I was so excited. I go to the cafeteria and the cafeteria guy goes, hey, the janitors were supposed to be here an hour ago. So old me would have been like, fuck it, let's go, right? Like I, I would have I probably fought that guy. Uh, knew me at that moment went, oh, animators must not look like me. And he is basing this response on what he sees every day. What am I going to do with this? All right, I'm going to use this to fuel me to be an even better animator so I can teach him that people like us can do this, because he was Mexican too. And I'm going to become friends with him, and he's a cook. So he's going to give me free breakfast every morning. <laughs> and that's what I did. So every opportunity for conflict, I now it's a game. I'm like, how do I judo this? into something that helps me and helps the other person, and that we're both happy, and that maybe I get a free breakfast out of it. <laughs> Recently, El Tigre was in All-Star Brawl 2. Did you, first, first question, did you play that? I have played it, and it's the most played character in Latin America, which when they told me, my heart exploded. I was so excited. Okay. Another, so my other question is the main one is, you're definitely what I call a visionary with your, you have, like Thank your you. art style is so distinct, so you. How do you, um, I under, one, something that can be difficult for visionaries is working with, 
is working with others. How do you, um, what are your tips for someone who is, for someone who does have a lot of great ideas um, working with others in producing them, like getting, like just in terms of getting along with others and creating a positive work environment? I mean, the, one of the things that happened to me was because I did so much on my own, I felt a lot of empathy for the background designers and the, you know, basically every, the more jobs you did, the more you feel for the people doing the jobs. So that really catered to becoming a good leader, right? I, I hate public speaking, by the way. It's horrible. But again, I realized if I want to be a director or a showrunner, I got to get really good at it. So I, again, forced myself to get into these things. Uh, and so if you're not a people person, it's a skill you develop. Uh, and you know, if you guys watch videos of me talking, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago, I would shake constantly. And sometimes at the end, I would have to take a nap because I was so overwhelmed. Now, it's super organic to me and I don't even think about it. Like I don't even prepare for these things anymore because it's just a, a second nature thing for me. So if you, if you want to become a good leader, honestly, it's studying other good leaders and studying bad leaders and going, why did that not work? What was it that they did? How do I do that better? How do I learn from it? And I think, again, if you make something and people like it, they're going to want to work with you. So that, that's the hard part, right? Because as you, as you graduate from school, especially when you're, when you're starting out, you have all these very ambitious ideas, but they're just words. You have to make something so people go, oh, this person's not just a talker, he's a maker. And how do we help him make more? Um, hello there, I'm Brian Urquhart. I'm a graduate from Exceptional Minds of cool. 2022. And I was just in the 2024 Anna Jam done by Exceptional Minds like a few weeks ago. Um, I really appreciate how you've brought more awareness to Latino America and Mesoamerica work. Thank you. I was just asking because um, I had some issues with my team dealing with um, communication issues and um, getting ideas across with a team. So how would you sort of do it? Whew. Uh, I usually try to put myself in their place when I try to explain things. And then if I see that there's confusion, I try another way and I try another way and I try another way. And I'm the first person to admit that when I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Like I have zero ego about any of those things. Uh, but I will, I will say most artists are visual, right? So sometimes explaining things verbally is difficult. And so I find myself drawing stuff a lot uh, where I go, hey, what if we did like this and you do a drawing and they go, oh, I get it. And describing that drawing is really hard. So getting really good at sketching fast and sketching on the go is a huge asset. But I, I definitely think, at least for me, it does, did not come natural. None of us in art school or in film school uh, wanted to be managers. And that's basically what show running and film directing and producing is. You're managing people. And as you guys know, artists are the most complicated, weirdo uh, humans on earth. So managing artists is really hard. And so it's a skill that you develop with time. Okay, this will be our last question. Uh, hi, Ori. So oh. I have like a question. Have you ever been socialized with anybody who are animators just like you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know what, what happens is when you find like-minded people like yourself, you create communities. And as you start your careers uh, and you, you know, this is called networking, you, the moment you're doing well and people go, oh, my God, I love your work and how things are going with you. Do you know anybody else like you? Guess who you're going to recommend? Right? Your friends who are like you. So try to align yourself with people like-minded, uh, create a community as you're starting out your careers. Everybody kind of, they're, they're all, we're all in the same boat. Every one of your heroes and every one of my heroes started out as a film student <laughs> uh, or someone who didn't study film and started from the bottom. No one, you know, literally, no one came out of their mom's womb and was given a TV show or a movie. Everybody earned their way up and it, Usually took a ton of work. Of course, there's nepotism. Uh, may you be so lucky. Uh, but 
I would say 95% of, of people in the animation industry just work their way up. Uh, I will say it, now that I've been in the industry for 25 years, I'm gonna guess 50% of the people I've ever worked with uh, were neurodivergent. Uh, I would say most of my director heroes are autistic uh, and are autistic. Uh, there's a generation who doesn't want to get tested and doesn't want to admit it publicly. Uh, when I was tested, my representation at the time, uh, who I'm no longer with, said, you can't tell people you're on the spectrum. Uh, because that'll just be another reason for them to not want to hire you. And at that time, I said, well, if someone doesn't want to work with me because I'm on the spectrum, I don't want to work with them. Yeah. Right? So, I'm super open about it, as you guys can tell. Well, thank you all for your questions. We really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Jorge. He will be with us all day today and will be in a few other sessions, too, this afternoon. So thank you again. All right.